Okay? And so we're going to call that C for completeness. It's really simple. It's what proportion of the likely set of species at our site, what proportion have we detected and dom documented? Okay? And notice that we can measure C for any set of data for which we can use these inventory statistics. All we need is the number of species documented at any point in the inventory, and we need the guess as to how many species there really are. It's just the proportion. Okay? So now, instead of talking about, I'm going to sample for five days, or I'm going to sample for 100 trap nights, we talk about sampling until our results achieve a certain level of quality. So we might ask for C above 95%. Okay, we might want to say we want to have some statistical confidence that we have detected 95 out of every 100 species. Then we might also want, maybe not, maybe yes, but we might also want to look for some stability in the results as well. Just to protect against those jumps that you sometimes see. The weather changes, you know, whatever. Uh, could even be activity patterns of the species. But we might want to add in something like a number of days without adding new species. But notice what I'm talking about is the quality of the results, the completeness of the inventory. Both of those are in some sense a measure of completeness. Okay? Um, what this means is that in that parkland, where you went right up to the near final, final uh, inventory right away, you may be done very quickly. And in that miserable habitat, you may stay there a long time. So because of that, it's not always logistically feasible. You, know, you may need to say to the driver, uh, come back in 10 days. Okay? And you may not have a way of communicating with the driver, I, I need another 15 days because my accumulation curves are still doing this. Right? So, with that in mind, we can still try to think about sampling and stopping sampling based on results rather than based on effort. So this is from that same study I showed you a moment ago. And now we have to kind of look at different things. This is the observed number of species, as is this. If you want to ask me why in the final publication I use different symbols for observed species in the two graphs, I don't know. Okay, young and stupid. Now you're old and stupid. Yeah, now I'm old and stupid, thank you. Uh, so notice that the observed number of species with zero effort is at zero. And the observed number of species goes up and up and up. And in Mexico, it gets to 31 species and stops. Can't detect any more. And in Lawrence, it gets to 50 species and stops. Okay? So out here, I could sample for another 1,000 days, and I can't add anything to the fauna. Of course, we never know where that point is in, the re in real life. But my interest is, with these uh, four different indicators, sorry, three different indicators, these three, um, how do they approach the truth? And so one thing that turned out to be kind of interesting is that if they approach from below, like look here, you can get a false signal of being fairly complete even though the real truth is up here. See that where this point gets close to the observed? 
And that has to do, remember, we're only using categories one and two of the frequency of detection. That has to do with if, by chance, a couple of ones empty out, that can make a lot of difference. Okay, if, if just by chance you see the second individual of several species before you see the first individual of other species, you can, you can get these kind of blips like that where it kind of looks like you're done. So the main point is, you see everything is converging on the same numbers. Of course, look here, we get some rather consistent bias. So we might want to be careful of those indicators. But the point is, the completeness index is the difference between this and the estimate, right? It's what proportion of the estimate is represented by the observed. <coughs> okay, so what you could imagine doing in an ideal situation where logistics were not complicating your life, is you could imagine sampling, and with each sample or with each 10 samples or each 100 samples, whatever, you could imagine calculating your inventory completeness and asking, am I done yet? And you would have concrete quantitative stopping rules. Might be completeness index of 95% and five days without adding a species to the inventory. Might be something like that, okay? But it won't be 50 trap nights. Question, hold on. Think now. Hold on a sec. <laughs> hmm? I'm trying to think now in terms of a multiple study. So mm -hmm. if you're you setting up samples that will be done every year in April for the next 10 years, this would then be your pilot phase where you estimate or you, you eventually come to the ideal number of trap nights, but you wouldn't do this every year this results based or would No, I think what I would do is every year I would run my sampling until I had met those stopping rules. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That would you would consider kind of your pilot phase. So no. See if I if I say, okay, I do this the first year and okay, thirty trap nights was enough or thirty days of sampling, whatever. What if the second year it's a late spring or it's, uh, it's cloudier or maybe the forest has been cut, whatever, any difference can make that amount of effort needed to achieve good results different. Mm. So my idea would be that the first year you'd go out and you'd sample and you'd sample and you'd sample and you'd say, and oh, I've hit my st stopping rule. And the second year, I'm going to go out and I'm going to sample and sample and sample. Maybe it's easier or maybe it's harder, but I'm going to do that until I hit that same stopping rule. But my idea is I have some quantitative basis for believing that I am at the same level of completeness rather than just the same amount of effort. Just trying to work out how you then compare those results year on year when you're well, you can, you can use things like rarefaction, where you back stuff off to the, to the lowest level. Um, but I would say that I, I would be more interested in just looking at your final estimates, because your inventory results, your, your completeness index, basically suggests that they're now comparable. Okay? So if I get you know, this number of species in one year and this number in the second year, those are comparable in a way that an effort-based sampling might not be. You know, if every day is like this rather than every day being nice and sunny. Yeah. Again, it gets complicated because you set aside two weeks for this year's study and maybe in one year you need three weeks. Yeah. So you get into a lot of trouble. I've, I've played with this on local landscapes, essentially inventorying individual habitat patches but I've never done it on big landscapes because you need flexibility that you usually don't have. Okay. Any other questions?
So essentially what I'm trying to say is this. Imagine that we have four sites. And imagine that they have very different um, species richness. So let's imagine that it takes me, you know, I can, I can detect 10 species per hour. Just imagine that. Well, to sample this best site well, I need 12 hours. So if I use an effort-based stopping rule, to say, this is if I sample everybody for 12 hours, if I use an effort-based stopping rule, I sample that, that site well. I get right up to my stopping rule and I stop. But I put a lot of extra effort into these other more species poor sites. And so my inventory took me 48 hours of work. Let's say I just use the average amount of time needed. Well then, these two sites with 70 species in 28 hours of sampling, seven in each, these two sites with 70 get sampled spot on. But my rich site is undersampled and my poor site is oversampled. So 28 hours, I've wasted some time here that I needed there. If I could be flexible, and I'm fully cognizant of how logistics screw up the very best of intentions, then I could put 12 hours here, two hours here, seven and seven. I use my 28 hours, same amount here, but I've spent the right amount of time in each site. I know that's a cartoon, but that's the idea. That parkland, you don't need a lot of days to detect all the species there. That nasty, impenetrable jungle, you could take the days that you would have oversampled the parkland and you could sample the jungle better. Okay? So that's just kind of ideas to throw at you. I'll throw you, at you another idea, which kind of scoops what I'm gonna show you um, on Wednesday where we're going to talk about how well have we sampled. This is something that I stole from Jorge Soberon, but it's my revenge for his not coming along. <laughs> so Adolfo, this is a map of Mexico, but it's herbarium data. Can I show this? Okay. okay, thank you. He was upset at me for showing so many bird examples. So this is 691,000 records uh, accumulated from 30 of herbaria in Mexico and from elsewhere. You can see there's a lot of coverage. The sparsest coverage would be up here in the northern deserts. And in fact, you can see the roads, okay. It's partly because of access. It's also partly because the really fun stuff to sample is down here in the tropical parts and the montane parts. Those northern deserts are awfully similar to things in Arizona and New Mexico and things like that. So let's take this data set and ask how complete is our knowledge of the flora of Mexico? And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this map and we're gonna split it in half and half again and half again and half again. And so we're gonna go from a really coarse resolution to a really fine resolution. So at the level of the whole country, which is two million kilometers, we get a completeness index of about 78%. Clearly things to learn, which is to say we clearly still have some singletons in the data set, some species that have only been found once but it's mostly done. Now let's split the country up. Uh, here's your scale. 
And you could see it all at the beginning that the less well sampled regions were in the northern deserts. And we start to get kind of better sampling in these huge pixels, okay? But better sampling in the center and south than in the north. Let's split it up again. Okay, and now we see even more the northern desert, some of the coastal areas. Split it up again. Look at this, now we get some sites, some areas that essentially have no data. Um, below 0.1. Sounds like everything's a singleton there. Okay, still have some areas that are pretty well known and some areas that are really badly known. Keep going. These are 22 by 22 kilometer squares. And now we really start getting some detail in our map. Look at that. Mexico City and kind of the, the, the really easily accessible parts of the transvolcanic belt. You can see the road down to Acapulco. Okay. Um, essentially we're seeing reds only in here. Up here, I'm seeing a lot of white and a lot of yellow and green. Let's keep going. Had to put it on a gray background or you wouldn't have seen anything. But this is just five by five kilometers. Okay, and this is doing the, those calculations and getting the C index for every one of these pixels across the country. And what you can see is, at this resolution, we don't know anything. Most of the country hasn't been sampled. So that's just kind of to get you thinking that all of this is scale dependent. So the, the quantitative, the inventory statistics offer us some quantitative ideas to how, how, how done are we? How far along are we in this process? I would say that you really shouldn't interpret an inventory, a species list, unless you see the statistics that accompany it. It's very key in documenting whether sites are thoroughly assessed or not. Critical in establishing absence of species and very good in, in helping us kind of optimize future inventory efforts.